Europe, 100 years ago. Superpowers and their alliances rule the continent. The Triple Entente, consisting of Great Britain, France and Russia, controls East and West. Between these countries lies the Triple Alliance, Germany, Austria-Hungary and Italy. For years, these countries have been arming for war, a war for supremacy in Europe. In 1912 and 1913, regional conflicts break out in the Balkans. The Ottoman Empire declines and new nations are created in the spheres of influence between Russia and Austria-Hungary. The Balkans are a volatile mix of languages, religions and cultures. Here in the Bosnian city of Sarajevo, the story of Europe is altered forever. It's Sunday, the 28th of June, 1914. Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austrian throne, is visiting with his wife to observe the army on maneuvers. Many Bosnians are furious, as they consider Austria-Hungary an occupying power. And the Habsburgs, tyrants. earlier. For more than 600 years, the Habsburgs have ruled from the imperial city of Vienna. However, the dynasty's golden age has long passed. In the early 20th century, the Austro-Hungarian Empire faces economic and political problems. Austria-Hungary was described as the sick man of the Danube and as a stagnating superpower. This was unique within Europe. The world saw the Austro-Hungarian Empire as rather a, an amusing sideshow to the, uh, the business of being a superpower. The Habsburg Empire consists of more than 10 nations. The Slavic populations are disadvantaged, particularly compared to the Austrians and Hungarians. Almost 50% of the empire's population was Slavic, and there was this fear that the empire could fracture. As nationalism grew, every nationality within the monarchy asked itself why it did not enjoy the same rights as the Germans in Austria or the Hungarians in the Hungarian half of the empire. The people demand more say and even democracy, but are unable to compete with the rigid state structures and the strict social hierarchies. The social order dates back to the Middle Ages. I think this monarchy was an anomaly in a Europe that was gripped by nationalism. However, this does not mean its end was inevitable. At court in Vienna, time appears to stand still. The empire is ruled by the world's oldest monarch. Emperor Franz Josef. Kaiser Franz Josef. Emperor Franz Josef knew he had reached the end of his life. He had no ability or even will to change anything. And this was probably the most significant factor in what followed. The future of the monarchy will be decided by the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. I think it is very hard to judge Franz Ferdinand. He was such a complex, temperamental character that few people could claim to have been unaffected by him. We know of the many problems of this enormous empire, and he was not a stupid man. The suicide of Franz Josef's son, Rudolf, establishes Franz Ferdinand as the heir to the throne, a man previously impervious to the responsibility and etiquette of power. 
He traveled the world. Of course, a lot of the travel was for hunting, particularly in India. They shot many tigers and many other animals besides. Franz Ferdinand is obsessed with hunting, killing more than 270,000 animals in the course of his life. The future heir is driven to persevere, to overcome obstacles, and to win. In life, as in hunting. He had exceptionally good judgment and was an excellent shot, unlike many of his contemporaries. He spent most of his time at Adstetten Castle. From some of the early photographs that remain there, it appears to have been a comfortable home. Here in Lower Austria and at Konopisch Castle in Bohemia, Franz Ferdinand keeps his distance from the hostilities of the court in Vienna. His vision of a union of southern Slavic states within the empire, equal to the Austrians and the Hungarians, is unpopular in Vienna and makes him many enemies in Serbia. Emperor Franz Josef was opposed to his nephew Franz Ferdinand's marriage to a lesser aristocrat, Sophie Kotek of Kotkova, but eventually relented. To fight for a woman like that, to wait and be patient, it really was true love. Sophie was awarded the title from Hohenberg, but Franz Ferdinand was forced to renounce the right of his children to ascend to the throne. He is therefore more intent than ever on becoming ruler. Europe's kings and emperors congregate here to pay their last respects to one of their own, England's King Edward VII. It is a family affair, as all the ruling dynasties are somehow related, and yet before long, they will pit the people of their nations against each other in a bloody, bitter conflict. The funeral of King Edward was an incredibly symbolic moment. Uh, you know, the death of a, uh, an emperor, if you like, and uh, the death of an age. Among the mourners, representing the 81-year-old Franz Josef, is Franz Ferdinand in a white dress uniform. It reminds me a little of that scene in the Godfather film where all the, uh, the dons come to, uh, to gather somewhere upstate of New York, still imagining that the world was theirs to carve up, whereas in fact that was very shortly coming to an end. At the time, Great Britain is the world's greatest economic and military power. London rules over a colonial empire of almost half a billion people, a quarter of the world's population. We have, you know, the whole of India, half of Africa. We have the, uh, the plantations in the Caribbean. It seems like the world is ours. Britain likes its position as the, uh, the world's superpower, and uh, it was very aware of its position, and it was very determined that it should maintain that position. The German Empire is determined to put an end to Great Britain's predominance. Just a few decades before, in 1870 and 1871, Emperor Wilhelm had united the German states under Prussian leadership. After the unification, Germany expanded rapidly. The German economy booms, and the German army increases in strength. The country was so successful that it is hardly surprising that the neighboring nations became nervous. Germany's oldest rival on the continent is France, the only democracy among the superpowers. After the war of 1870 and 1871 and the defeat against Prussia, the relationship with Germany was of particular significance to France. In 1871, France lost Alsace-Lorraine to Germany. The Alsace-Lorraine question continued to overshadow the relationship between France and Germany. 
Russia is continental Europe's largest empire. Serfdom is still well established and social and economic conditions continue to decline. At the outset of 1914, the situation in Russia was extremely complicated. Russia provokes a war with Japan as a distraction from the empire's internal problems. After the defeat in the Russia-Japanese war, tensions in the Balkan countries increase rapidly. When Austria-Hungary annexes Bosnia-Herzegovina, Russia is forced to return its attention to the Balkans. A memorial mass in the small Serbian town of Shabats. Here and in every church across the country, the anniversary of the long battle for Serbian independence is celebrated annually on the 14th of February. The uprising against the Ottoman Empire began in 1804, led by Kada Georgia. He had fought for Austria against the Turks. Serbia. Serbia was liberated in 1804 by an army of rebellious farmers. The Serbia of today was therefore built by Serb farmers and rebels. The Kara Georgia revolution gave Serbian society an egalitarian, even democratic character. At the time, Austria-Hungary supported Serbia in its uprising against the Turks. Austria and Serbia had actually had a very good relationship since the 18th century. Almost all the doctors and architects in Serbia were students from Munich, Vienna or Graz. However, only a small portion of the Balkan Serb population live in independent Serbia. The fundamental aim of the new Serbian kingdom is to free all Serbs from foreign rule. From Norway to Greece, the flags of European nationalists demanded liberation and unification, and the Serbs demanded the same, national unification incorporating Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo and Montenegro. This is destined to lead to conflict with Austria-Hungary, as the empire is home to many Serbs. The Serb king, Peter I, intends to establish a greater Serbian empire, which includes those regions populated by Serbs currently under Habsburg rule. However, following the Congress of Berlin and Austria's invasion of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia found itself surrounded by Habsburg territories and allies. In 1908, the Imperial Army annexes Bosnia-Herzegovina. The province has been administered by the Empire since 1878. Serbia is offended and seeks out allies. Russia and Serbia were traditionally very close. This was not just because Serbia was a Slavic and Christian Orthodox country, but because the Serbs had always been loyal allies on the Balkan Peninsula. The Serbian army on parade. In the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913, Serbia significantly expands its territory. And Serbia continues to recruit allies against Austria-Hungary. From the moment the relationship between Serbia and Austria-Hungary began to deteriorate, Serbia sought out new partners particularly France. Austria-Hungary's Balkan policies have failed. Great faith is placed in the Imperial Navy to maintain regional superiority in Southeast Europe and in the Eastern Mediterranean. The Austro-Hungarian Navy was one of the most modern in the world. On the whole, however, the Imperial Army was falling behind other European forces due to lack of money. The Habsburg monarchy continues to lose ground in the arms race between the superpowers. For example, balloons are still used for military reconnaissance rather than airplanes. 
Das Problem ist die Konsequenz. The difficulty was to face up to the consequences and say clearly, we cannot fight a war because you will not provide the resources we need. The biggest mistake was not admitting that to themselves, to state officials and to the emperor. Das ist der große Fehler. October 1913. In Vienna, celebrations mark the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Leipzig. The future is ignored, the past revered. The glorious victories over Napoleon are remembered, as is the Austrian-led establishment of the new European order at the Congress of Vienna. If solutions to the problems of the empire are not found rapidly, Emperor Franz Josef is in danger of passing a monarchy without a future onto his heir, Franz Ferdinand. The idea of war surfaces repeatedly in domestic and foreign policy. Germany also celebrates victory over Napoleon with the opening of a memorial to the Battle of Leipzig. The German Empire, ruled by Emperor Wilhelm II, plans to build on the successes of the past and continue to defeat France in battle. The tragedy was that people believed these successes could be repeated again and again. In fact, there was even this sense that one owed such repeats to those who had gone before. Emperor Wilhelm believes his army to be the best in the world. He's determined to use it to achieve German supremacy in Europe. Russia and Great Britain are also in his sights. In fact, Wilhelm II was essentially the last person who should have led this blossoming German Empire with its established military traditions. Germany's most important ally is the Habsburg Empire. Wilhelm II and Franz Josef hold joint imperial army maneuvers to ensure that they can defend their predominance in Europe if it becomes necessary. Franz Josef was old, perhaps even ill, but he was still alive. As long as he was still able to draw breath, the choice between peace and war remained his decision. His heir, Franz Ferdinand, is opposed to war. His primary ambition is to solve the conflict between the nations of the empire and give the Slavic regions more say. He did not want to continue Franz Josef's policies, and he was probably right. Franz Ferdinand also wants to reform the army, a task he entrusts to Lieutenant General Oskar Potiorek. Potiorek governs Bosnia-Herzegovina with a heavy hand. As a display of strength, he plans significant army maneuvers. Franz Ferdinand is to take part. One could also interpret it as an attempt by Franz Ferdinand to check up on Potiorek, to keep him on his toes, as he was a potential successor to the position of Inspector General of the Austro-Hungarian Army. The maneuver is to take place on the 28th of June in Sarajevo. People think that history is uh, something that's planned and, and takes place in a very organized way, but uh, it's like life, it's very haphazard and uh, doesn't quite fit the patterns that we like to try and make of it. It was entirely logical for Franz Ferdinand to observe the maneuvers in Bosnia. They were the biggest army maneuvers of 1914, and their successful completion removed any obstacle to the appointment of Oskar Potjorek as Inspector General. Everything had gone entirely to plan, and he was very satisfied. While Franz Ferdinand was on maneuvers, his wife made several visits to Sarajevo, where she went shopping and visited an orphanage. There was an official reception in Sarajevo planned for the next day, the 28th of June. In recent years, there had been several assassination attempts by a Serb resistance group, Mlada Bosna, Young Bosnia. Mlada Bosna is part of a European phenomenon. Europe's crowned rulers are being hunted. 
He was advised to cancel the event, but at the same time, Governor Potyrek told him that the people would be offended if His Imperial Highness did not appear. Of course, it isn't a Serb city. It's a city with just as many Muslims and Croats and some Jewish inhabitants. And they welcomed Franz Ferdinand almost enthusiastically. On the way to Sarajevo's town hall, a chain of unfortunate events that will alter the course of history begins. First, there is an assassination attempt with a bomb. The bomb bounced off Franz Ferdinand's car. But it blew up just as he passed, and it caught the car behind, and uh, one of the officers was injured. The mayor awaits his guests in front of the town hall. Franz Ferdinand is furious and coarse, and is actually very impolite to the reception committee. Nobody knows whether there are more assassins lying in wait. The rest of the day's events are cancelled. But Franz Ferdinand does not leave. He wanted to go to the hospital and see the victims of the first attack. There are more assassins on the streets of Sarajevo, waiting for an opportunity to strike. There's a famous photograph of the Archduke's car at the very moment before the assassination. You can see the wheels just beginning to turn. That is a wrong turn that the Archduke's car is making. The chauffeur has not been informed of the changes to the route. The car is forced to reverse. He has absolutely no idea how many of these young people are still in the vicinity. One of the assassins just happens to be standing on this very corner. And this miserable youth fires and hits my great-grandfather in the neck. My great-grandparents die. It is an unmitigated disaster, and the city is completely unprepared to deal with the situation. Anti-Serb riots break out throughout Sarajevo, and Serb homes and businesses are looted. The Serb population and the Kingdom of Serbia are blamed for the assassination. The Austrians went looking for hard evidence that they could pin on uh, Serbia. In the end, they invaded anyway because they couldn't find any. The role of Serbia in the assassination is very tenuous at best. The bodies of the Archduke and Duchess are embalmed and brought to Vienna via Trieste. They were then taken to Adstetten Castle and placed in the crypt. The marble sarcophagi that can be seen today were installed much later. But who is the man who murdered Franz Ferdinand and Sophie? His name is Gavrilo Princip. He and his co-conspirators are captured and charged with treason and assassination. Princip states that as a Bosnian Serb and revolutionary, he intended to kill an oppressor and a tyrant. Gavrilo Princip, Gavrilo Princip was born in the Habsburg Empire, not Serbia. He was one of Franz Josef's subjects. Princip had nothing against Franz Ferdinand personally. He was simply the heir to the throne. He and his friends, who included Muslims and Catholics, saw the Habsburgs as a colonial power in Bosnia-Herzegovina. For many Serbs, the date of the visit was an additional provocation. On the 28th of June 1389, they had lost their independence to the Ottoman Empire at the Battle of Kosovo. Now they were once again occupied, oppressed by the Austro-Hungarian soldiers. The assassins wanted to fight and die for Serbia, as their ancestors had done in Kosovo. They were naive, uh, very young, incredibly young. Two, two of the people who lined up to shoot the Archduke were only 16. They were still at school, and uh, Princip himself was only 19. Does, does an 
He knew that the assassination would have serious consequences and result in the death of the Archduke. But he had no idea of the tragic events he would set in motion. They've made a plan, for sure, but it's not really much of a plan. They've just, you know, let's line the street and then let's, uh, you know, who will be the bravest to uh, fire that pistol? He is a tragic figure. These youths were turned into fanatics and taken advantage of in the worst possible way. A secret Serb society, the Black Hand Gang, provided weapons, but the assassins deny receiving any official Serbian support. There is absolutely no proof of any involvement by the Serbian government, led by Nikola Pašić. Nothing that would suggest they even knew of the plans. Three of the adult conspirators are executed. Princip dies in a dank cell in 1918. To the end, he maintains his regret at the death of Sophie. They had no intention of murdering Sophie. They actually intended to kill Potjurek, the military governor of Bosnia. Two targets. First, Franz Ferdinand, Second, Potjurek. I assume that Gavrilo Princip simply fired at the people sitting in the car, and the two sitting upright in the back, the Archduke and his wife, just happened to be the closest. Oskar Potjurek has been a soldier all his life, yet he has never experienced war or indeed people being shot. The assassination was a huge shock for Potjurek. Witnesses at the time claimed he was completely confused and barely responsive after the attack. He may have wondered what this meant for his career, as the attack had shaken the very foundation of his existence. Essentially, Potjurek was responsible for the security measures in Sarajevo. One can, of course, blame the chief of police or the mayor or other people equally, but there is no doubt that the final responsibility lay with him. Potjurek spends the weeks following the assassination doing everything he can to shift the blame for Franz Ferdinand's death away from his failings and onto Serbia. I think it was certainly in his interest to deflect attention from the events, to make people forget it's an obvious course of action. Emperor Franz Josef is at his residence in Bad Ischl when he hears of the assassination. He returns to Vienna immediately. He will have to decide how Austria-Hungary will react. By the time of the funeral for Franz Ferdinand, Emperor Franz Josef has already expressed his intention to find a military solution. However, a war with Serbia could also lead to a war against Serbia's ally, Russia. Franz Josef was fully aware that Russia would support Serbia and that there was a distinct possibility of war with the Russians. If Russia becomes involved, Austria-Hungary will need Germany's support. Emperor Wilhelm vows to stand by his ally. He simply repeated the same thing he had told the Austrians many, many times before. His Highness, Emperor Franz Josef, is a Prussian general. He need only command and the entire Prussian army will follow. Vienna must have fully expected this unconditional support. The intention to go to war was not limited to the emperor. It also played a significant role in politics. Even the foreign minister, Count Berthold, shared this enthusiasm for war. Vienna is convinced that there will never again be such a perfect opportunity for war against Serbia. Foreign minister Berthold is among those calling for hostilities. The militants hope that Germany's blank check will win over the last remaining opponents to war. The Hungarian Prime Minister, Count Tisa, is initially opposed, as this could increase the numbers of Slavs within the empire. His Austrian counterpart, Count Sturk, 
is an early supporter of the war. Finally, it is decided, the implementation of Operation B for Balkans. In Serbia, people are unaware of the impending war. Shabac, a Serbian city on the border of Austria-Hungary. The lively town is also known as the Paris of Serbia. The song recalls the prosperity of the merchants of Shabac before the First World War. Following the assassination in Sarajevo and the accusations leveled at Serbs in Serbia, the immediate reaction was, what now? Dear God, please, not another war. Following the two Balkan conflicts, the Serbian population is tired of war and the Serbian army is exhausted. In the border town of Shabac, the people hope that all will remain calm. The spectacular double murder of an heir to the throne and the wife he fought to marry for so long. This is the version of the assassination that is repeated across the world. In international newsreels and beyond, the assassination is primarily depicted as a crime story. In Russian newspapers and within the government offices, the assassination of the heir to the throne in Sarajevo was considered an internal matter for the Habsburgs, as it had occurred on Austro-Hungarian territory. At court in St. Petersburg, several voices clamor for war. But Tsar Nicholas II initially opposes any idea of conflict, fearing that it could increase political tensions in the huge Tsarist empire. However, on the 2nd of July, Foreign Minister Sezonov receives word from Serbia. Austria-Hungary has demanded it be allowed to conduct investigations within the territory of the Serbian Kingdom. It is immediately clear that Austria-Hungary is beginning to put pressure on Serbia. The Russian Secret Service also reports on preparations for war in Berlin and Vienna. The Russian side is therefore largely aware of what is occurring in Vienna and is absolutely determined to support Serbia this time. You could say that Russia, like Austria-Hungary, chose to go to war. From the very beginning, France has promised Russia unlimited support in case of war against the German Empire. The alliance with Russia was extremely important to Paris, as it ensured some security from Germany. So one can see the steps by which everyone's gradually inexorably been drawn to war. Great Britain is determined to resist involvement in any conflicts on the continent, as the country's political interests lie primarily with the colonies. However, London is at pains to maintain the balance of power in Europe, to ensure that Germany does not achieve supremacy. Britain was very well aware of the gathering storm. I don't think that anyone could not have been. And I think there were frantic diplomatic uh, maneuvers going on behind the scenes to try and prevent what was rapidly becoming uh, the inevitable consequence of the, uh, the assassination. In Sarajevo, Lieutenant General Oskar Potierek prepares for war with Serbia. Despite the responsibility he shares for Franz Ferdinand's death, he demands an immediate commencement of hostilities on an almost daily basis. 
In the middle of July, he even threatens to resign in a letter to Franz Josef's military authorities if war is not declared. It is one of the century's hottest summers. In Vienna, as in Belgrade and across Europe, people are unaware of the plans being developed at the courts and in the chanceries of the superpowers and how close war really is. The German Empire and Austria-Hungary hope to take advantage of the element of surprise and appear to conduct business as usual. The generals and admirals behaved as though they were unaware of what was going on. They all went on holiday because they had to keep up the appearance of normality. On the 25th of July, they all returned, one by one. On the 23rd of July in Badischl, Emperor Franz Josef signs an unconditional ultimatum to Serbia, giving it just 48 hours to comply. Franz Josef, had the... Franz Josef bears significant responsibility for unleashing war. He wanted a conflict with Serbia. He did not want to start a world war. On the 28th of July, war is declared on Serbia, although it has agreed to almost everything in the ultimatum, but refuses permission for imperial delegates to investigate the assassination on Serbian soil. This is presented as justification for a war described as a punishment for the murder of the imperial couple. The Serbs were aware of the prevailing mood in Vienna that all of Serbia was to be held accountable for an assassination carried out by a single Serb from Bosnia-Herzegovina. The artillery attacks started the day Austria declared war on Serbia. Oskar Potjarek has achieved his goal, a war that will erase any trace of his failure on the 28th of June. For Oskar Potjarek, this was a revenge campaign, a campaign he was prepared to conduct with everything he had at his disposal and at any cost. He was prepared to accept incredible losses. To the strains of the imperial anthem, the trains roll towards the Balkans. Austria-Hungary's ally, the German Empire, observes the reactions of Russia and France closely. The war that the German army had prepared for and that they hoped for was the war against France and Russia. The planned campaign was to take four to five weeks, at most. It wasn't just the German emperor who believed in a short war. This belief was shared by the German and the Austrian generals. Within a few hours, the fate of Europe is decided. If Russia mobilizes its troops, Germany is prepared to declare war. And then you have the Russians mobilizing and the Germans saying step back and then the Germans declaring war. Then the British saying, uh, you know, let's leave uh, Belgium neutral because they know that the Germans' first act will be to try and get into France, and so then Britain is bound to come in. C'est la logique infernale. This is the terrible logic of the alliances. Ça joue aussi de l'autre. It was the same for the other side when the German Empire signed a blank check for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Un chèque en blanc. So the Great War begins. The spark that set Europe on fire. Gavrilo Princip's bullets. They provided Austria-Hungary with a pretext to punish Serbia and caused a world war. I've always found it completely incredible that, that nations, empires would speak like that about one another and Europe was riven with these kind of jealousies and rivalries and we're talking about, uh, you know, feelings that one might ascribe to a, a bunch of spoilt children and they're about to lead to this terrible war.
The first... The first hasty operations began on the 12th of August 1914, and the first entry in Pocherek's journal is, today, my war started. They believed they were incredibly well prepared, not necessarily in terms of arms, but because their soldiers were particularly good. In the first days of the war, they suffered terrible losses. The troops, even inexperienced soldiers, were thrown to the lions. The inexperienced officers and generals had no chance against the battle-hardened Serbs. The strength of the Serbs had not been underestimated, rather, their own strength had been terribly exaggerated. The Serbs reacted with professionalism and fortitude. It soon became clear that Austria had gravely underestimated the resistance they would face. Poturek kept a detailed journal during the first months of the war. He writes about the weather, about the temperature. His entries are shockingly insubstantial. He is simply not prepared to accept that he is fighting a strong and experienced opponent rather than an easily vanquished inferior adversary. The Serbs have a special relationship with their nation. They see it as their property. This is why they fought so hard to defend their Serbia in the war against the Habsburg monarchy. History class at a secondary school in Shabbat. The great victory of Serbia and its population of four and a half million over an empire ten times its size remains a source of pride. Unexpectedly, Oskar Potjerek does not attack from the Danube in the north. Instead, the attack is launched across the Sava and Drina rivers in the west to surprise the Serbian forces. Austria-Hungary's first offensive lasted less than two weeks. Then the imperial troops were forced to retreat. Shabbats and its surroundings were completely destroyed in the brief conflict, and the Paris of Serbia became the Verdun of Serbia. Shabbats really did look like Verdun. The Habsburg troops that entered Shabbats were from the Second Army based in Hungary. There were lootings, abuses of the civilian population, mass executions and murders. Anyone who can escapes from the areas held by the Imperial troops. The war against the Serbian army has become a war against the Serbian civilian population. The racism, summary executions and the brutal punishment of partisan fighters are rife. The less success they had on the battlefield, the more their assaults on civilians increased. The civilians were hanged and put down, as it was known at the time. Across the region, civilians are taken as hostages. Approximately 120 women, children and old men are imprisoned in the church in Shabbats. Before the retreat, all the hostages are shot in front of the church and hastily buried in a mass grave. The massacre in Shabbat was just one of many that occurred in northern Serbia. 
The Shabbat's massacre was the largest, but similar events happened throughout the neighboring towns and villages. There were no houses where we are walking now. The train station was here, and here were the train depots. I am from Prinyavo. My great-grandfather was shot and killed here. My father was also brought here to be shot. I have been coming here since I was a child. I am 75 years old. Almost every family in Serbia lost someone, as did the family of Peter Shivkovic. Dear friends, dear young people, it is your responsibility to preserve the memories. Preserve the memories of those who lost their lives here. My father was here. This is where he survived, thanks to a hole dug for a telephone mast. He was lucky that he could hide in the hole, that he survived, that they didn't execute him. My father watched everything from there. This is where they were mown down. This is where they were buried. The executions happened like this. The firing squad was on the tracks, and the people who were to be executed stood here. The firing squads liquidated everybody from over there. Some people hugged each other. Others huddled together. They grew up together, lived together, and wanted to face death together. I think I have described the situation back then to you as well as I can. Observers stood around, silent, powerless, in tears. Oscar Potierek launches two more attempts to defeat Serbia, but without success. In autumn of 1914, the Emperor's army is forced to admit defeat. The Serbs have defended their country by summoning up all their strength, but they have paid a heavy price. Oscar Potierek never visits the front lines. He remains at his headquarters in Sarajevo. As his soldiers fight, he has a minor accident. The entry in Potyarek's journal is almost sniveling. Or is he, in fact, proud that he has a war wound? In any case, this was the only injury he received during the conflict. Potyarek certainly remained unmoved by everything that happened around him. Even the failure of the third offensive could not compel him to admit any culpability. On the contrary, he considered his removal from command unfair. After all, he had already made plans for the fourth offensive. Franz Ferdinand had hoped to reform the empire. Instead, his death marked its downfall. I don't think my great-grandfather can be held responsible for the millions of dead because the decisions that were made later were completely wrong. Emperor Franz Josef started a war that would destroy the old order of Europe. I don't like to use the term war guilt, although, like any intelligent person, I am furious. But the blame for the war clearly lies here in Vienna and over there in Berlin. The enthusiasm for war was followed by total hatred of the enemy. It was a biological disaster for the Serb people. Serbia is the country with the highest percentage of military and civilian casualties in the First World War. A quarter of the Serbian population, more than one million people, lose their lives in World War I. 
At the end of 1914 and the beginning of 1915, nobody knew how this great war, this world war, would continue. At the end of the First World War, more than 17 million people lie dead. An age of violence ensued, and it left its mark on the history of our continent. Many soldiers who fought in World War I, and far more of their sons, would return to fight in another world war, just two decades later. One can say that those things probably would have happened anyway. The world was heading towards war, but it just so happened that it was triggered by the shooting on the streets in Sarajevo. That changed the course of history for everyone, for all of us.